Hey everybody, this is Walter from Greenbrier Games, here with another how to play video for Champions of Hara. Today we'll be looking at the solo mode, which was unlocked by you guys via stretch goals, which is amazing, and I can't thank you guys enough for backing the campaign. Today we're going to look at Oryx, um, and in this story, uh, Oryx is trying to free Persephone, who has been captured by Ophion. I will say a few things before we begin, which is everything you see here is still a prototype asset that is in development, we are working on, and additionally, a lot of these things that you see here in Tabletop Simulator are sort of placeholders because of what we have to work with in Tabletop Simulator, like these bags on the different worlds as opposed to having decks there. Um, some things that are definitely prototypey are Ophion's card over here. This is Ophion in the middle. So I, playing as Oryx, start on the far side of Oppenheim, my home world, and Ophion has kidnapped Persephone and has her in his laboratory here in the Drear, and he starts in the dojo in between us, and we are going to be trying to run around beating up monsters, closing rifts, gaining the energy that we need to free Persephone. So we've got to collect 10 points of energy in any combination of these three colors and bring them back over here to Persephone to free her. All while Ophion is going to be trying to kick in our butts, he's going to be spawning these little minions that come out and march towards Persephone. If she gets defeated during this challenge, I lose. So over here I've got Persephone set up. Even though it's a one player game, I've got Oryx set up that I'm going to be piloting. And then I've got Persephone over here just to track her stats. Um, Persephone, when she takes damage, is going to be building up fear, and that's going to be able to help me in the game um, during this solo challenge. So all these solo challenges, they break the rules of the game. They come with their own objectives, their own. The whole scenario is going to give you some additional information about how you're playing. And the way I like to liken it is so a game like Gloomhaven or our big folklore project, like those campaigns are to a, let's say, Lord of the Rings movie marathon that Hara is more akin to a Saturday morning cartoon. So these are episodic little narratives. They're sit down, play this story that's going to be building towards a bigger story, but is also a standalone piece. So we set up the game just like we would in any regular game, where these uh, different worlds connected to the dojo here in the center. We start on day one, and we're going to have only until the end of day six to be able to take care of Ophion. So our objective is to rescue Persephone, bring her back to the dojo, and then we're going to tag team switch out. And I'm actually going to become Persephone. She's not a damsel in distress. She is totally able to handle herself. So as soon as we get the energy to free her, we're going to transfer it to her, bring her back to the dojo, and then we're going to tag team in as her to kick Ophion's butt. Ophion over here has 16 hit points, but we can't bring him down until after we've freed Persephone. It's part of the bargain. So game starts with a card on each of these world tiles. So we're going to have monsters coming out face up. I'm rotate it so you guys can see here. A lot of this is a bit more tedious in Tabletop Simulator than it is. Oh, that's an event. Events come out face down. And these cards are all coming out in the number one space of these worlds because we are starting on day number one. On day two, they'll come out in the number two space, and so on. And at the end of every round, we're going to have a card come out from the dust deck uh, that's going to populate on a random space here. So our objective is to fill up 10 points of energy across these three colors while dodging Ophion um, and then trying to free Persephone back here. After every one of my turns, Ophion is going to get a turn, which we'll cover when we get there. So when I'm playing as Auric, I have three stances to choose from, which we just covered in a recent spotlight update. So I'm going to look at the board and see that Miyazaru is here with only three health, which is a good early target for me. I have three activations on my turn, unless I choose Koi Stance, but I'm going to start in Crane Stance, which gives me plus one range, but abilities that cause me to move have minus one movement. So I'm going to start with dash, which is normally a move 2 card, but in this case is move 1 because of crane stance. I've activated it. It's going to move me one space. Then I'm going to backflip, which says, choose a monster corrupted within range 1. Transport to that space and deal 1 damage, but I get to choose a monster range 2 thanks to my new uh, crane stance ability. So I pop onto this guy, I've dealt him 1 damage, he needs 2 more. And perfectly, I have Galvanic Palette in hand. Deal two damage. Pop. So we got this guy. He's been defeated. Well, let's keep him over here. 
I'm going to gain one red and one gold, and I could steal an item from anyone, which reminds me that I start this challenge with a Dreamstone. Dreamstones uh, allow you to pull extra cards from these world decks, and in cooperative mode, they also allow you to exploit a weakness on the different villains. But we're going to cover Ophion as soon as his turn begins here. So, I just defeated a monster. I used three activations. And now my turn is over. So these guys are all now set to their on table side. Meaning I have three different abilities to look at here, and then still that same fourth ability in my hand from before. So, now it's Ophion's turn. We're gonna roll these two dice. And as you always, when it's the corrupted turn, you roll these two world dice together. The symbol die that we rolled corresponds to which of Ophion's abilities we're going to use. And then the number die corresponds to the different scenario effects. So in all the different scenarios, the number die is going to trigger different things, usually from sort of a, a list uh, with progressively worse or better situations. In this scenario, um, the rolling a number six means that one of Ophion's little minions is going to spawn on the number six space in the Dreer. And on every one of his other turns, this guy's going to start marching towards Persephone and dealing her some damage. And like I said, if Persephone is defeated, we lose the scenario. So we either have to let them beat her up or run over there and go sit protector from them. And it's a bit of a double-edged decision because when Persephone takes damage, she's going to be building fear. And as she passes those thresholds on fear, I as Auric are going to gain access to my ultimate, so I can gain my ultimate twice during this scenario if I let Persephone take damage. But I run the risk of Ophion attacking her. Um, so Ophion also rolled a green, which is Sleepwalk. Transport to the player with the least health to the same space as Ophion. That player takes two damage. Then if that player has no spirit, they have minus one movement on their next turn. And Ophion has a horrible passive ability here, which says whenever he deals damage, uh, to a player they're gonna lose that much spirit. So this scenario modifies Ophion slightly, which is that uh, his sleepwalk ability is always gonna target Auric, and his shattered will ability is always gonna target Persephone. And bleak ultimatum, bleak ultimatum is gonna hit both of us. So sleepwalk is hitting me, it pulls me to him. Not such a bad thing, because I'm closer to some other stuff. That player takes two damage, and in this case, I also lose two spirit. So I'm down. Uh, and then my turn continues. Now it is the dusk phase. Oh, we got a little tabletop simulator physics to deal with there. We're going to pull a card from the dust deck. Uh, can't be the Hydra. The Hydra has this boss symbol. There's one boss in each of the decks. This symbol right here means that they can't show up on day one. It's all it means. It prevents power creep. It prevents the game from getting out of hand too early. Yep. Yeah. So we'll just shuffle that guy back in. So we got a rift. Spawns by rolling these world dice again. And it's going to show up in Oakenmore on space six. It's over here, which is a big pocket of energy, and we want it. It's just good for us. It's right between these two events. If we're over here, we could take out this little guy. A couple different options for us on our new turn. So this is our turn number two. I'm going to switch to Koi Stance. And Koi Stance makes me more vulnerable, but it gives me four activations, meaning I can do all three of these things from the board and this card from my hand, which is something very special to Auric. Most players have to use an item or another extra ability uh, to get four activations, but or can do it at the risk of taking more damage here. So I'm going to start with move two, backflip. Move two, if you're in current stance, your next ability would do plus one damage, but in this case, we're just going to move the two. Bing, bing, land on this rift right away. First thing we do is gain a green, and then we're going to get to roll this die, and I have an opportunity to pay some spirit. Which reminds me, I'm going to use Ophion's weakness right here. Expose weakness, discard a dreamstone, all players within range 2 of Ophion gain 2 spirit. There may be a, a more optimal version where I use it so that Persephone gains some spirit back, but I'm going to use it now for me, just to make sure that I've got enough to close this rift, because it could be very helpful. Okay, so we give this die a roll. Of course, we rolled a 1, so we would have to spend all 5 of our spirit to close this rift, and since Ophion gets meaner when we have less spirit, I don't think it's worth it. 
So we're going to just say that we get that one free green uh, and the other stuff is wasted, unfortunately. Um, these guys only have one hit point. So let's do a nice tricky thing. We're going to dash. And the top of dash says, and this dash is a card that everyone has. These other three cards are abilities unique to Auric. Dash is a card that all players have. It says, perform the following effects in whichever order you choose. Move up to one space and then deal one damage range one. So I'm going to use it. I'm going to move one space, which is going to cause me to trigger this event. But the rest of dash finishes here, which says deal one damage range one. And I'm going to use it to squish this little guy. One hit point. He's done. There can only ever be six of these uh, in a turn. And note that if you're playing with the core game, you're just going to use a little token for these guys. And it's only in the expansion that you'll have those nice little minis. So because I squished one of those guys, I get one gold energy. And let's make it red. Uh, I know that if I level up in red, I'm going to get more offensive stuff for Auric. If I level up in green, more movement type cards. And if I level up in blue, more utility abilities. <laughs> a little round there. Um, utility cards. And that's... Uh, that's a different combination for all the different heroes. They sort of, as you learn to play them, you know which colors you sort of have to prioritize. And their little info card gives you some clues about that when you're choosing characters. So we triggered an event. The Dream Vault. Gain two red right away. We're up to three. Every time the Onoroi harvest a nightmare, a few good dreams get taken by accident. They, stole all, they store all those useless dandelions and puppies here in a massive vault. This is challenge seven. Pay spirit first and then roll. If I succeed, I'm going to gain a dream stone back, which is pretty big because it's allowed me to get spirit back in this scenario. Uh, and I'm going to gain another gold. So I have five energy to pay. I'm going to pay three of it and go down to two and hope that we can roll a four or higher. And the reason I'm not going below two is I know that Ophion's got a power that if he brings me to zero spirit, he's going to totally mess me up for extra damage, and that would be bad. So, four or higher. All right, we did it. So we're going to gain an extra gold energy. Let's make it red. While we're at it, we're almost at a threshold here. And, we're, and then we're going to gain another Dreamstone, which is important in this scenario for our longevity. Okay, and then this card gets discarded. We were on this space when it happened. So, we've used two abilities so far this turn, and because I'm in Koi Stance, we can do more. Um, but these powers aren't going to help me tons right now, so what I'm going to do is put out Sarasu. And Sarasu is a card that stays in front of me, so here we're going to see a little limitation of my prototype which is that we don't have the right tokens in here. So instead of the tokens that you would use to track up, it's got the numbers one, two, three, four in the corners and you would put it in the center of this card and, and use it to build these tokens. We're gonna use this die. So we start at zero tokens and so it says, Sarasu, when this card's in front of you, gain one charge for each point of damage you take. So when I take damage, uh, I'm gonna start building up. We'll start at one charge when I take damage, then two and then three. And then I can, when I pick this card up, now that it's sitting on the table, I can deal damage equal to the number of charges. So this could potentially be a high damage ability, but for now it doesn't have any charges. I haven't taken any damage. Uh, I'm out of movement effects, but I will spend that dream stone again to gain some more spirit using Ophion's weakness. So these cards that I played come back to my hand. They're on the in-hand side, ready to use again. And these two cards are still in front of me. They have not been used yet. Okay, so that was Dusk 1. Now it's going to be Ophion's turn. Let's see what he does. He's going to use Bleak Ultimatum, which is bad. Not really not good for us. Uh, and he's going to spawn a little guy in the number 4 space. So, oh, right on Persephone. So at the start of the next... Uh, one of Ophion's turns. Geez, tabletop simulator physics here. Um, this little rascal is going to hurt Persephone and then disappear. They, they sort of deal one damage to her and they're going to delete one of her spirit and then they're going to pop away. Um, and Bleak Ultimatum. All players immediately gain one activation, which may be used following the current turn order. So if we were in multiple, multiple players playing in a co-op scenario right now, we could all use one card. But then every player who's not dealt damage by another player this turn takes three damage. So I get to use a card for free this round, which is going to totally change up the flow of how my abilities are. But 
I'm going to take 3 damage unless Persephone hits me, which she can't, and Persephone's going to take 3 damage unless I hit her. So, I don't have any abilities that can reach her, so I'm not going to bother. We're both just going to take a bunch of damage, which is going to suck. Good thing I have Sarasu out, but I will use that free power to dash, to move 2. I'm just going to move me up this event. So when I start my next turn, I'm going to flip that event right away. And it doesn't matter that I'm here right now. It won't trigger until the start of my next turn. So that happens, and then we both take three damage. So fortunately, now Sarasu is geared up, ready to be dropped for tons of pain. But I'm down from seven to four. And Oric, I can, I can die once as Oric, or be defeated, excuse me, as Oric once this turn. But Persephone, she cannot. So let's lock that in place here. So Persephone is going to take 3 damage, which makes her scared. She's down from 8 to 5, meaning she is totally almost fragged. Uh, but, in this scenario, when Persephone reaches these thresholds, I get to take my ultimate as Oryx. So here I have Belly of the Beast, which is a really powerful card. Belly of the Beast is an ultimate, so it's one-time use per game, although in this game I'm going to be getting a second copy of it if Persephone takes enough damage. Belly of the Beast says, change to any stance, referring to my three stances as Auric, and then it's going to have a different ability depending on which stance I'm in. In Tiger, I get to move in and deal a bunch of damage. In Crane, I get to explode and deal uh, damage to a bunch of different targets. And then in Koi, I get to heal. And I'm thinking, based on where we are, that I'm going to have to use Koi, the Koi effect here, to keep us uh, in the game. So, that was Dusk Phase. At the end of the Dusk, we're going to pull one of these World Event cards. Alright, good. It wasn't the Drear. In this scenario, if we pulled the Drear card, Ophion would get an extra turn, which would be really bad. World Shift the Lunar Ridge. So we're going to gain a blue, and it reads, The Lunar Ridge boasts mushroom-sprouted mountainsides populated by a tribe of deranged philosophers, all of whom believe themselves to be the village elder. Switch the locations of the Lunar Ridge and the dojo, keeping orientations the same. All players gain two spirit. Players at max spirit would gain a gold energy instead. So, pretty good for us here. I gain two spirit, up to six, I gain one blue. So we're approaching, we've got four, five, six. We're getting close to being able to free Persephone. Uh, and then we're gonna switch the dojo and the Lunar Ridge. So we gotta be a little extra careful here in Tabletop Simulator when we're switching zones, if only because the physics in this game are a little bit funky. Ah, uh, see, right there we lost the card. Something that, of course, would never happen if you were playing with the physical components. Cards don't phase through boards, typically. You never know with her, though. Uh, okay, and this card is still on my space. So now we have a new map. We're on a new dawn, dawn of two. So cards are going to come out from these world decks on the two space of each zone. Monsters are going to come out face up. Is an event, so it stays face down. Zing. Oh, we got a big guy over there. Oh, stay face down. Okay. So, I'm here. It's a new turn. I have to pick a new stance. Uh, there's a bunch of monsters around me, so I'm just going to go right to Tiger and say it's time to kick some fool's butts. So, first thing that happens is I'm on this event. So, let's give it a read here. The Brother's Dilemma. Gain one red right away. Which is excellent. So now we're at, we leveled up in red, so at the end of my turn I'm going to get to pick a new red card, which is really good. You stumble across two lunatic sages arguing loudly when they finally notice for you to clamp... For you, when they finally notice you, they clamor for you to weigh in. Choose one, agree with Turtle and fight Tumult, or agree with Tumult and fight Turtle. And we know that Tumult's big meanie and Turtle's kind of a nice guy. So we're going to go in and search in here. Oh, they're going to make it really annoying to search, aren't they? Of course they are. If I was Tabletop Simulator, this is how I'd do it. Alright, so. He's going to take the place of this event. 
let's uh, get these guys back in there shuffle that up and now I'm on this guy so I could beat this guy up and I would get a bunch of points I'd get three blue and one gold which actually if we made it four blue we'd level up in blue too and have enough to go heal Persephone which would be really good and we wouldn't have to deal with this other guy next to us who's got armored and dangerous and all this bummer stuff going on here or we could ally with them and we could uh, have Persephone or me heal. I'm not too worried about that because we already decided we're gonna use Belly of the Beast to heal. So let's just squish this this fool. We are in Tiger Stance, which says our abilities deal plus one damage and they have minus one range. So that's Sarasu we've been charging up. Right now is prime time to just delete Turtle off the map. So we're gonna use our Sarasu with three charges and we're in Tiger Stance, so that's four damage. It's a really powerful effect. That just squishes turtle right off the bat here and we're gonna gain our three blues and then one gold which will make blue as well so at the end of this turn we're gonna level up in two colors which is awesome now we have two more activations we could totally squish this gruffalo who is aggressive, meaning he'd punch us a little bit. So we're kind of a tough decision here. We could run all the way around, avoiding anything, but it would take us longer to get to Persephone. And we know Ophion's gonna be messing us up, so that would be bad. Um, we could go through this event. If we end our turn here, we are gonna get smacked by the Gruffalo. So if we go through this event, Let's do it. We're gonna. There may be a sneaky way to get everything we want if we use Belly of the Beast properly. So if we backflip onto this guy, this will be action number two for us. Uh, it won't work the way we want. So we'll have to make this make this happen. We'll have to Galvanic Palette. Your next attack deals plus one, and then backflip, which is gonna deal two because of our Tiger Stance which allows us to squish this guy. Giving us two more reds and one we'll make there, but we already have plenty of energy to go free Persephone, so that'll do it. Um, but he's aggressive, so we took two damage when that happened, bringing us down to two, which is not so hot. Okay, so that was three activations. Had we maybe played that better, we could have used Belly of the Beast this turn. Uh, but these cards are going to come back to my hand. They're going to be in their in-hand side. So I'll have to replay Sarasu again to build that up. I've got this sitting in front of me. I'm not in range of any monsters, so I'm not getting attacked there. And that would have been my dawn here. So now it's going to be Ophion's turn. Of course he does. Okay, so he's going to have one of these guys on space four. And there already is one there, so... If there's one on Persephone, it's going to basically lemming itself onto her, dealing her a spirit and a damage here. She goes up to four. She's good. And this guy goes away, but a new one shows up on four, meaning next turn that same thing is going to happen again. Okay. And Ophion's orange ability here, Shattered Will, which transports him over to her. So we got a bunch of minis on this space. It's not going to work out as great in Tabletop Simulator. We'll leave him. Leave this guy off to the side. Tabletop Simulator doesn't want these guys to be friends, so this might be a little challenging. So we'll put them both off to the side here for now. You guys get the gist. They're on the same space as her. If we were in real life, they could occupy the same space. Uh, so it's gonna he moves to her, and he's going to deal her two damage, which also drains her spirit, 
So she's really low. She's down to two and two. We need to heal her right away. She's gonna die. So we know that we have to. We have to activate Belly of the Beast, switching to Koi Stance this turn. Um, change to any stance. Maybe we should start in Koi. There's a way for Belly of the Beast that allows you to use two stances in a turn, which can get you some really powerful combinations of things. Um, so I'll start in Crane Stance, because I have to pick a new one. I'll use my first activation to backflip. Choose a monster range one. In this case, it's range two because of crane stance. So, pop it over here. And I don't need any more energy, so I'm going to use the red Rifting's ally ability, which gains two health. So ally is one of the keywords listed on your little info card here. And ally says, while in the same space as this monster, you may discard it and activate the ally ability instead of fighting for its loot. So I could squish this little cutie, or I can make him an ally and gain that two health instead of fighting him. But I don't gain the other rewards. So that was one activation. Now I think we know we have to use Belly of the Beast. So let's make sure we do use it. It says, change to any stance. We're going to change to Koi. And it says, you and your teammates may choose to gain any combination of four health and spirit. Oh, I brought my ROM meter up here. This is this is at four. This was at there we go. So getting a combination of four health and spirit. I'm gonna go up to nine, three, and one on Auric. And we're gonna go up all four on Persephone. Because she can run out of spirit, though that does mean she'll take more damage from Ophion. But we really can't let her run out of health. Oh, she took she took two more damage, so. She's terrified. That's good. This is gone. That was my two actions, but now I'm in Koi Stance, so I know I have two more. We're definitely gonna want Sarasu on the board. Oh, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Um, at the end of the last turn, I leveled up. So when you level up in a color, you get to take one of the two cards of that color. I leveled up in red. So, Art of War, which is really good in combination with Sarasu, and then has a little heal on the bottom, or Die, which deals tons of damage up front. And I think we're going to be just a straight shooter here, and we're going to go for just Die. Um, and then we have two options for blue. Vision Quest, which is going to allow us to get extra Dream Stones throughout the game uh, and, regen and regenerate Spirit, which is actually really useful for Ophion. Um, but I think I'm going to take the slightly more straightforward one here, which is Osaru, which functions very similar to Sarasu, so it's doubling down on when you take damage, you're going to be gaining these offsetting effects, and Sarasu allows you to empower your next ability here. So, this is in my hand. Osaru is in my hand from last turn. Those are the cards I leveled up into. I've played Sarasu, Backflip, here, and my ultimate, and I have one more ability, which I will use as Dash to move the two spaces, moving me onto the same space as Persephone. So now that I'm here, I'm going to transfer, this is part of the scenario, I have to transfer 10 points of energy uh, to Persephone to free her. So I'm going to transfer five red, Set seven and five blue. So her bars are going to go up the same amount, meaning that when I switch over to playing as Persephone, she's going to get a chance to level up, which is awesome. Uh, and now I'm going to have to run her back to the dojo where she needs to heal up. She's been she's been being experimented on by the owner. These guys have been doing horrible stuff, pulling the nightmares out of her head. She's really phased. So we're going to bring her back to the dojo where she'll be able to get back into fighting condition and then send her out to take down Ophion for those 16 points. Now that she is free, we can damage Ophion on the way. Um, I don't have any opportunities to damage him right now because I've used all four of my abilities. Uh, but I will soon. So we're going to take her off here. She's being carried by me right now. That was my turn in Dawn. It's now Dusk. Or that was that was Dusk here. So we actually had one more of these come out. Over here. 
on red four. Bing. Okay, and Ophion gets his turn. So, uh, purple four, bleak ultimatum. Gosh darn it. So he's also going to get another one of these little guys on space four. But that's not such a big deal now that we've saved Persephone, though the one that was here is going to hit us. Which we're okay with because we're going to trade off from Auric. And that does build one charge here. And then he uses the bleak ultimatum, which says that we all, both me and Persephone, get an extra activation, though we know she can't use it. Um, and if we don't take damage to one another, we're going to take three damage apiece. So I see that I can actually reduce the amount of damage that Persephone would take by one if I hit her with my own galvanic palette. Um, but alternatively, I could let us both take the damage. Persephone would go to Max Fear. She would be really hurt. Um, but I could move us closer to the dojo. So it's a bit of a gamble, but I think that's what I'm going to do. So I'll use my extra activation from that to dash two spaces. We're close to being able to get Persephone back home. Or I could just wail on the guy. Yeah, let's we'll keep it. Keep it as is. Um, and Auric over here is going to take four points, actually, because he's in uh, Koi Stance here. Good thing I healed. This goes up to its max, though, which is good. And Persephone's going to take three, which is really bad. She's really hurt, uh, but she is going to go up to max fear, which is good. And Ophion stays where he is here in the drawer. Things are freaking out. Okay, so that was our two turns. It's now dawn of day three. We're approaching the end here. When this happens, we flip one of these world events. World shift Elkinmore. We gain a green. Doesn't matter for Auric, because we're actually going to be switching to playing as Persephone in a second, but I guess I'm still Auric for now. Torn asunder from the great forest, Elkinmore bears the curse of a century-old sorrow, which causes its cuddly flora and fauna to undergo horrific transformations. Switch the location of Elkinmore in the dojo, keeping orientations the same. All players must pick up or put down a power without activating it, which can be really, really good. Because um, it allows you to kind of circumvent your own uh, patterns with your abilities and use the same side of an ability twice in a turn. It wasn't what I was hoping for, which was a nice heal. Um, but it is good enough for now. So I need to pick up or put down a power. Uh, well, we'll put down Sarasu. Oh, sorry, for sure. Because it only helps me when it's down. It would otherwise just take up an activation. So we put that guy down. And now it's done. Three. Two, two. We got guys coming out, and this will be the last round that guys come out from these decks. Uh, because now our focus is just on defeating Ophion. guy's gone in this phase. He's done. And last one. Okay, a lot of events out on the board. So we're actually going to be trying to avoid these for the most part while we fight Ophion, who's over here. So, Oryx turn. Doesn't really matter what stance we're in because all we have to do is pick up Dash from the board, which lets us move one space, getting us to home base here. So, now we're going to kind of change gears. We just brought Persephone home. We're ending our turn here so that she can gain three health. That's what happens when you end your turn in the dojo. We're going to give her three health. She's up to six. And we're switching out. Persephone is no damsel in distress. She is very powerful in her own right, very fierce, and she is going to come after Ophion herself. She does not need us to be her babysitter. 
So, we're actually going to switch characters. We were playing as Auric. Let's get all this together here. We were playing as Auric, but now we're playing as Persephone. And she's coming in with everything she had. So, she leveled level up in red and blue. So first thing, we're going to go through her deck here. We're gonna pull out all these cards with the gold corners because those are the starting abilities that everybody gets. They've leveled up in red and blue, so we've got two choices. We've got a choice between Void Step, which teleports to somebody and then can deal some extra damage to them in the other side, uh, or Void Swap, which is more of a puppeteering, moving a bunch of different things around the board. Since I have a singular focus right now of getting after this one big target, we're gonna go for Void Step. We have a choice between Siphon Sorrow, which we know is going to gain us some good health back, uh, or Claws of Nether Beast, which has a higher total damage output. Though I am really worried about her being defeated, since we don't have many hit points left, and she, if she loses, we're done. Uh, I'm going to go all out. So, it's our hand of six abilities here as Persephone. We have two main attacks, basically three different movement abilities with a little bit of damage output on them as well, and then Fever Dream, uh, which is something that is going to both generate fear and help us do extra damage and gain a little bit of health back. So a really useful utility kind of card. So we're now that we're set up at Persephone, we ended our turn there, we gain our health. That means it's now Ophion's turn. Hopefully he's not a huge jerk. He got a green. Sleepwalk. Transport the player with the least health, which is me, because there's only me left. That player takes two damage, then if they have no spirit, they're going to have minus one movement. Honestly, that's totally fine. Because we're here to kick this guy's butt anyway. Except Tabletop Simulator, where we hate sharing a space. Uh, okay, and then we take two damage also in his case means that we're at zero spirit and again everyone these are prototype player boards the real ones are going to be coming in soon this is just my crummy graphic design and then we'll talk about the nice ones when we hit that next stretch goal it's gonna be awesome okay so that was his move we're here as persephone we've got three actions and we are just trying to blitz this guy 16 hit points down we only have a few more turns to do it in So we're just going to come right at him. We have Claws and Fangs. Fangs of Fear lets us, if we're terrified, uh, we could spend one fear because we're scared here actually. Going down to seven. And when you're terrified you're also scared and that's why I can use both of those parts of the power here to deal him three damage for our first activation. So he's going to go down really quick from 16 to 13. We totally got this guy. This will be no problem. Um, and we're going to use Claws for number two. That's another three. And if Claws were used on a player, you could actually steal some spirit from them. But Ophion doesn't have any spirit to give. And we could do one more thing. Um... I'm going to say that we use Shadow Form, which is going to let us move up to two. We're actually not going to move any space. Actually, yes, we definitely want to move away from Ophion, taking extra damage here. So we'll move the two spaces away from Ophion. So we're not going to in his range for that basic attack, which we haven't actually had to deal with yet this game. Um, but more importantly, with Shadow Form, if you're terrified, you prevent the next two damage that would be dealt to you this turn. So we're going to be blocking two of the damage that Ophion is going to try to deal. So that was our move. He's down really fast, which is awesome. 
And he's going to be using Sleepwalk again, which is a problem for us because now we're out of spirit. That, of course. Do we just delete Persephone from the board? There she is. Let's shrink this guy a little bit. We all know who he is. Play nice. So we're down two to two. And we also are lower, we have a lower ability to move uh, thanks to Sleepwalk's other effect here. So we're in serious trouble, actually. We might get squished. I thought we were going to hammer him. He's got 10 hit points left. We only have two. All of our movement cards are reduced by one, so we're going to have a hard time totally fleeing the scene here. Um, these cards... Are now on these sides here. So I could still... Shadow Form would let me move three spaces, but I trigger this event, which I really don't want to mess around with what that event could be. So I could go around this way, but it's only two because of the penalty two more it would I could spend my whole turn and I'd just be able to get to the dojo alternatively fangs of fear has a little heal built onto it here so it says deal two damage range one scary to me pay one fear to gain health equal to the damage dealt by this attack so we have three actions He's at 10. Okay. It's going to be really close. I don't know if this is going to work. You guys are my witness here. Fever Dream. Take one damage. Your next attack deals plus one damage and has one range. So we're getting really scary. But that's the fear that we need and the extra damage. So then we're gonna fangs of fear. And if you're scared, you can pay a fear. Back down to seven. And it's gonna do three damage because of fever dream. And because we paid the fear, we're gonna gain that much health. So we're back up to four, which will hopefully, fingers crossed, be enough to survive. We dealt him three. He's down from 10 to seven. That's pretty good. Last power, claws another beast. Deal one damage, range one. If you're terrified, you can pay. One fear to deal plus two damage. That's three more. He's down to four. So these guys are back in my hand. These guys are in front of me. We have four hit points. And it's this jerk's turn. Here we go! Same sleepwalk power, which we know is okay. It's only dealing two. Had we gotten hit by uh, Shattered Will there, we would have lost. So we had a 33% chance of losing that fight right there if he had pulled Shattered Will. Uh, and Bleak Ultimatum would have dealt us a ton of damage, but might have actually given us a chance as well. Um, so, it's our move again. He has four hit points. We know flat out that we have no problem dealing four damage with our activation. So we're like, bang, bang. We cut Ophion down to size. He is defeated. Screw this jerk. Get him out of here. So, that was a, a really quick run through. I know I did a lot of things really fast and uh, didn't necessarily do everything perfectly accurate. I think we skipped one. Uh, board change right at the end there. I was trying to get you guys a feel for these episodic little narratives, these quick challenges. In the full cooperative mode, there's a, usually a lot more of a, a tense, we need multiple players running around, gathering things from the different worlds. You've got all these sort of different pieces that need to uh, be handled at the same time, which is why those games are really designed for multiple players. There's nothing saying that you can't play the cooperative modes with uh, one player playing as two characters, but for me, that's not what a true solo mode is. So for this solo mode, you only ever play one character at a time, and it's got these sort of straightforward objectives that you kind of have to puzzle through. So we saw before, Auric 
We had so many options as Auric as we were moving around this board that we could have really gone in any number of these different places to take out some of these cards to gain the energy that we needed to switch back over to Persephone to take down Ophion. And, and had things gone a little bit differently and we had maybe a different set of abilities or if we had gained any items, that could have been either a lot easier or a lot harder. Like if we had only gained four of each color energy as Auric, it would have been enough to free Persephone, but not enough to upgrade her abilities. So we would have had to either face Ophion without these upgraded powers or maneuver out into the onto the world to gain levels as we were going but we we're about to run out of turns soon so there's a lot of tension building um, throughout and this is still obviously everything we talked about is a work in progress this is just one of the many scenarios that's still in development phase um, but I'm really really excited about the solo mode if only because I as a designer spend a lot of time playing this game alone <laughs> surprise 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 uh, but I know that a lot of people on the internet uh, have commented and talked about how they really like solo modes in games and I think that we have so much potential here for solo opportunities so that the six solo scenarios that I have written so far um, I'm really excited about and the next challenge is going to be developing those for the expansion characters um, and yeah so this was just a solo playthrough video of one example coming up soon we're going to do a full cooperative game where we'll have other players in and we'll see some of the more complicated scenarios that involve a lot more t uh, teamwork coordination and planning ahead Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you've been enjoying these videos. We'll be putting out a lot more soon. If you haven't checked us out, Champions of Horror is still live on Kickstarter. We're doing really well. We're burning through stretch goals. And I got to thank you guys so, so much. Okay. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.